Okay, well, it is one o'clock and it looks like we got a lot of people online here. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We are recording this. So if you miss anything, I will send out a link later as to where you can find it once we get everything up and running. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, this is Christy Rhodes with Risk Management and Tort Defense. And I'm going to share my screen here so we can all see what's going on. Okay, great. So thanks again for coming today, everybody. Uh, we are going to have a brief refresher on the property casualty insurance information system. So it's just a little training for our users. And we try to offer this every couple of years. Um, for, unfortunately, we have to do it online this year instead of in person, but I think all the information is still there and we'll have some time at the end to answer questions. Um, so to get started, let me make sure. Okay, so we're gonna do introductions. Um, there's my information if anybody has any questions. I know most of you have um, spoke with me or asked me questions before in the past. Again, always email or call if you ever have any questions. Denise Bo is joining us online today as well. She is helping me out. Um, she is another one of our financial specialists in the division. And we are with risk management and tort defense, obviously. Uh, I'm thinking we're going to take about 45 minutes today, maybe a half hour to go over things and then a bit to answer questions. And then if you have anything afterwards, please feel free to get a hold of us. And I did want to mention that when you registered for the class, you should have got a link to download the handout. The handout is just this PowerPoint presentation. So I will warn you, there's a lot of information on these slides, more than I would normally do if I were giving this presentation in person. But I kind of geared it towards a like a quick reference guide for you. So if you wanted to print it out and then use it as you're going through your exposure data reporting and updates this fall and in the future, um, that's kind of what I was hoping this would, the handout would be, is just a quick reference guide and some more information for you. So with that, um, and if you have any questions as we're going along, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, I'm going to have some time at the end if anybody has any questions and just wants to hold them all until the end, that's fine. Or if you're the kind of person that just likes to have everything in writing so you can use it for future reference, feel free to email me. Um, after the presentation today and we'll get you everything you need. So just a brief description or background on who we are and what we do. So the Risk Management and Tort Defense is a division within the Department of Administration. Uh, we have four main functions. We provide cost-effective commercial insurance and self-insurance program. We provide loss prevention and service training and services. We provide legal defense. Uh, we work with agency legal services as well as your agency legal staff if there's a lawsuit brought against the state. And then we also have claims adjusters on staff who adjust uh, property casualty claims on behalf of state agencies and the university system. So what is risk exposure data reporting? Why are we here today? So we have a process where agencies and universities report their insurable items to us. And every year we ask agencies and uni the university system to go through everything that's in PCIIS, the Property Casualty Insurance Information System, and make sure that what's in there is current, up to date, has all the information we need and all the data that is required by our carriers for our insurance um, program every year. So PCIS was, is a, a Java database that was developed almost 20 years ago now. I think we're on our third upgrade and second for sure, maybe third, and the fourth is in progress. So by this time next year, we're hoping to have a few things updated and a little more functionality in the system. So it's probably going to look a little bit different next year when we're doing this, but all of the functions will still be the same and there'll be some new things that I'm sure everybody will be really happy with as well. Okay, so the process. Each year in October, I send out a email that has all the instructions for what I need you to do every year, which basically means get into PCIS, look at your data, 
make any updates or changes that have happened over the last year, update values, and then get new things into the system. So assets that your agency has acquired over the year, so new cars, if you have new office leases, those types of things, those all need to be updated between right now and July, or excuse me, January 15th. So we need you to look over your data that's in there. Um, and then we need to have you report new stuff that you've acquired over the year. Also, you need to end coverage on things that you don't have anymore, such as old office leases. If you have a, a bureau that's moved office spaces or to a new lease space and they no longer have the one that's in the system currently, we need you to end coverage on that. Um, if you have multiple vehicles that have been traded out over the year, we need you to enter the new ones if you haven't already and end coverage on the old ones. Anything that's been sold, demolished, abandoned, destroyed, et cetera, that will not be in service for fiscal year 2021, we need you to end coverage on that so you're not paying for insurance premium when you don't need to. Participation in the state property casualty insurance information or program is mandatory unless it's an optional coverage or something um, that your agency does not require. And then once again, January 15th, that's the big deadline. We need everything submitted online by January 15th. So then we can start working on the data for our renewal. So what's the process? Just so you can kind of see it pictorially. We have you and your agency review, add, update all of your data by January 15th. Once you hit the submit button, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that is to lock you and other agency, your agency users out of your data for the year. It copies it over to a second uh, data set. And that's what Denitza and I and some other folks in our office use to um, review, clean up, uh, just get it in a form that our insurance brokers need. So it takes a couple months to do that. And, and at that time, you'll be locked out of the system. You can always view what you have but you won't be able to make any changes or updates at that point. I will mention this later, but if for some reason you submit your data and then you get a call from another um, agency or somebody else in your agency that says you just got a new cop inclusion vehicle that you need added, no worries, just give us a call and we have ways to get around things like that in that kind of gray area time when we're reviewing your data. So after we get all of the data reviewed and questions answered, we send it off to our insurance brokers and they go through the data again, come back to us if they have any questions on anything we have submitted. They send that off to the underwriters who again, review all of our data and then the broker negotiates with the underwriters and the carrier and they try to determine the best coverage and premium. And all of this has to happen before the July 1st renewal. So it seems like six months should be plenty of time, but it does take a long time for this whole process to go through. We have almost 6,000 buildings on our property schedule, almost $6 billion worth of value. So that's a lot of assets and things for everybody to review. So after that process, here we go. Okay, so how do we get into PCIS? You go to our website at rmtd.mt.gov and then you scroll down to the agency resources section and you see the link that says PCIIS. Please always use that link. Um, if you set up a bookmark in your browser, set your bookmark to our main page, rmtd.mt.gov and then always scroll down to that PCIIS link. It just works a little better because um, it's a revolving site that you're hitting. And sometimes if you set a bookmark, it doesn't always point you in the right direction. So just always bookmark this page and then scroll down to PCIS right there and log in from that link. Once you log in, you get to the navigation page. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and come out here and log in. So to log into the system, you use your network ID and password. So you're using your same ID that you use to log onto your workstation every day. The next string you get to, most of you won't have an option here. It'll just take you right to your data, to the, the navigation screen where you can access your data. Users that have more than one entity 
And mostly this would be users such as um, some of the university system users have a couple entities that they are responsible for. Uh, Public Health and Human Services has a few users that they have access to facilities and institutions around the state. If that's you, then you're aware when you get to that screen, you'll have some options. You need to choose the appropriate entity that whose data you are looking at that day. Otherwise, the rest of us just go right in and, and get to this screen. So this is a navigation screen. Um, and we're gonna go back here and just look at some examples. So from here, you can see we have four items on the navigation screen, well, technically five. Navigation, data, edit, and entry, view and export data, PDF reports, and documentation. So navigation was where we just were, that just kind of gets us into our data. The data edit and entry is where you're gonna spend most of your time, if not all of your time. That's really the big driver of the system. That's where we look at our data, we review our data. If somebody calls us up mid-year and says, I have a, a motor pool car and I can't remember if we have comp and collision on it, then you would go here, you would go to edit data, you would look for your comp inclusion schedule and find that car. So this is really where people spend 95% of their time in the system is adding new things, reviewing current things, and then finally submitting risk, ex risk exposure data. As you see, the link is the fourth one on your list and that's the one that you wanna do on or before January 15th. And as I mentioned, after you hit that link at the end of your exposure data review for this year, you will be locked out for a little bit. So if there's somebody else in your agency that is also updating data for your agency, make sure you coordinate with them because whoever hits that first will lock both of or all of you out for your agency. So if that happens, don't worry, we can always fix it, but just try to coordinate with everybody and so we don't submit our data until we're really done for the year. And you can do that anytime before January 15th when you feel that you've got everything taken care of. So add new items. That's when we get a new car, a new comp inclusion vehicle. Um, maybe we have a new leased space or our agency or university has a new building. We would add new items there. Edit data, that's where we look at and review current information that's in the system, current properties, current uh, fine art, current vehicles, boilers and machinery. That's where we look at things that are in the system and we need to go in and update things such as uh, comp and collision values. Those need to be updated every year for those vehicles. So you would go to edit data and update your comp and collision vehicle values from there. Edit liability data. That's where we would go to input our liability data for the year. So the number of FTEs class A employees would go there. Um, the number of vehicles you have by class would go there. And so that's where you take care of the liability information for the year. So now we're gonna Go back here and look at a few examples. All right, so the data edit and entry screen, we're gonna go to edit data just because I don't wanna add anything new right now and we wanna see something. So if you go to edit data, it's gonna ask you what line of coverage do you wanna look at? So let's just choose boiler machinery. If I'm looking for a specific boiler machinery, just say, let's say somebody asks if there's coverage on this boiler, then I can put the value in right here or if I don't know what I'm looking for, or I just wanna check my list, then I just hit search and it brings up everything that the Department of Administration has in the system right now. So if you are looking for, let's say the boiler um, at 1301 East Lockheed, I, in order to open that record and see the details, you need to mouse over that row and click on the text in that row. That will open up another screen well, where you will see the details. And if there's anything there that needs to be changed, let's just say you got um, some bad information last year and the BTUs was actually 90 or 950,000. You could go in there and update that information, click save and cancel. So that works, that's essentially the same process that you would go through for every line of coverage. You pick your line of coverage, you hit search, and then you get a list of all the items that you have under that line of coverage. So now we're looking at, um, now we're looking at property. So let's just pull up the Capitol building. 
property requires a little more information. So if you have a new property, back on your data edit and entry screen, you would say add new. I have a question. Yes. Are you expecting us to see your screen? Because all we see is the PowerPoint at the moment. Oh, thank you for telling me that. Yes, you should be able to see my screen. Hold on one second. Cancel. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. You bet. Okay, it says I'm screen sharing. I wonder why it's not. All right, hold on. I'm going to stop screen sharing and then I'm going to go back in and see if it lets me. Okay. Now, can you see PCIS? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I chose commercial properties so we can look at that as an example. So I went to my data edit and entry, edit data, and then hit search. It brought up the list. And then we're just going to pick one. So in order to open that record, you need to click on the text. There we go. Okay, so property is one of the most lengthy screens that asks the most questions. But in general, they're all similar. You're, you know, you're going to be asked the name or the vehicle, where it's located. You know, if we're in a vehicle screen, we're going to say year, make, model, VIN number, all that good stuff. So when you're entering a new property, you're going to need all this information. Um, most of the fields are required. You'll see that with the asterisks. And then when you get to the bottom of the screen, and this is going to be true for every record, if you see a blue text or te blue text, that's a drop down menu. So go ahead and click on that blue text and it will give you options. So you don't have to free enter any of that data. And then property is a little bit more robust than the rest because a lot of things are hooked to your property records. And so at the bottom of the property, you'll see other information. So if you're in your property record and you say, hmm, is there any boiler data associated with this property? You could click on boiler data and it will bring up the boilers that are at that location. Uh, that is also where, I was trying to think what would be a good example. That's also where you would enter any special contents if there were any for that location. Special contents is by definition something that is not typical to that space. So if it's an office space, your copiers, your laptops, your computers, your supplies, furniture, those are all normal office contents. But if there's anything atypical to whatever that content is, then you would add it as special content. So you clicked on the gray button at the bottom that says special contents, add special contents, um, and then you'll get another screen that allows you to add contents. Okay. So let's just look through a couple others while we're here. The other one that people use the most is going to be your vehicle comp and collision. And similar to the property and all the other lines of coverage, once you hit search, it'll bring up everything that your agency has listed for vehicle comp and collision. Um, so we're just going to pick one here. Oops. And there's the information for the vehicle, for vehicles for comp and collision. So if you need comp and collision for your vehicles, you would just fill out all this information and then hit save. Every vehicle is going to require a market value. Uh, you can either go to the NAD web, NADA website on your own, or you can click the market value button up here in the right corner of the box, and it will open another browser window where you can put in the year, make, model. Um, and then you just want to choose the basics. You don't have to add a bunch of stuff. We just need a basic value, uh, a clean retail value, not the trade-in, um, but the retail value for that vehicle. That's what you need. And every vehicle must have a market value because if you don't have a market value, you're essentially insuring zero because vehicles are insured based on their value. So it's very important that you put a market value in when you're entering your comp and collision vehicles. Okay. So let's go back and I'll make sure I do this right this time. about the PowerPoint presentation.
Okay, so on to the next screen. The next item on your drop down menu or the, the next thing that you can do in PCIS, which is also very valuable this time of year, is to view and export your data. So the view and export data menu, when you click on that one, it'll bring you a drop to a drop down of all of the lines of coverage in PCIS. So this time of year, um, if you have agency or field offices or bureaus that aren't, um, you know, close to Helena, you could take your vehicle comp inclusion list, separate it out by your bureaus, send it out to them and have them review that information to make sure it's current. Um, every agency user kind of have a, has a different system of doing it, um, but with this uh, view and export function, it makes it a lot easier to get that data out to your folks so they can look at the same thing you are and ensure that you have everything correctly accounted for every year. So uh, the example here, we chose uh, vehicle comp and collision. So I clicked on vehicle comp and collision, and then it asked me to choose a report year. So 2021 would be the current year, the data that's currently in the system. And if you wanted to look at historic data for some reason, you can always go back and choose that as well. I chose 2021, I hit search, and then I got this box um, table that downloads all of your 2021 vehicle comp and collision records into this table. Now, if you just wanna look for something in there, you can search by using the top row, or you can sort uh, by using your arrows for the make, model, year, what have you. Uh, but if you really, really wanna look at your data and uh, parse it out, anything like that, you can export it into Excel, which is really helpful. Click the bottom left corner, that button that says export into Excel, and it'll open up another window where you can see all of your data in Excel, and then you can sort it, save it, um, split it out, whatever you need to do with that to make it easier for you to review and update your data each year. And then finally, um, the last two options on this menu, PDF reports and documentation. Uh, PDF reports at this time is only has one report as an agency user and it's your insurance summary. So if you're interested in what you paid, your agency paid for insurance over the years, you could um, click on that and it would show you a very high level insurance summary. Basically it will say you had 20 vehicles and you paid um, you know, 300 or $3,500 in comp and collision and an average per vehicle, things like that. It's just a kind of a high level overview of your agency's insurance summary for the year. And documentation is just any help files that you might need, any uh, basic user documentation in the system, you can get that right there. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move on to specific lines of coverage and what we're looking for when you're reporting them. And before I even start, and I'll mention this numerous times from here on out, but when you are in the system, at any time, if you go to the top uh, right corner, it says for more information or for help on this line of coverage, and it, there's a little link. You click that and it takes you to the online help page. That has everything you need to know, and I send that out every year. It has a section on every line of coverage, how to report it, um, what to report, and instructions on how to do that. So there's a section for every line of coverage and the link to that is right at the bottom of this page. It's at the bottom of all the pages. It's in the email that I'm gonna send out uh, later today with the instructions for the year. So that is a very, very good resource. If you ever have any questions um, on how to report something, you can always check there. And most of the times you can find the answer. It's a very lengthy document, so it might take some looking, but it's usually there. So with that, um, just so I don't, forget to tell you that's probably one of the most helpful resources when you're reporting your exposure data is that help file that's online that you can access from within inside PCIS or you can access it from our website or the link in the email that I'll send you um, this afternoon or tomorrow. Okay, so property insurance is probably probably not the, the most important of all of our lines of coverage and it is the biggest. We commercially insure that so we have a $2 million deductible and the agencies have a $1,000 deductible unless you are participating in the high deductible program that might be different. But we have almost $6 billion worth of property insured on our schedule. Uh, commercial carrier picks in, picks up after $2 million. So we have a loss that goes over $2 million. 
our commercial carrier will come in and uh, take the part of the loss over two million. So that shields the state insurance fund from an, any big hits. Um, two million is significant, but um, we had a forty-six million dollar loss in Bozeman a couple years ago. So we paid two million of that, and the commercial carrier kicked in for the next forty-four million. So okay, so our coverage uh, is your basic property coverage for perils such as earthquake, fire, flood, wind, hail, things like that. Um, we do use the state's commercial property uh, excess insurance to adjust those claims. So basically anything that's covered under a commercial policy, we cover as well. And as we looked at earlier, in order for your property to be covered, we need all of the information in PCIS, such as the year built, number of FTEs, stories, et cetera. Uh, property is based on view. Value is calculated on the square footage and the occupancy code that the user chooses when they input that property. When you input a new property, after you save it, you need to go back and review in your um, view data the amount, the value that it, it calculated for that property. So you want to make sure that it's adequately insured. And if you think the value is different or uh, more or less, then you can contact our office and we'll work with you to get a accurate value in the system for that. Um, there's many, many different things that are insured under property. Very Sometimes some, some of the very unique things are insured under property and you don't always think about such as outdoor equipment, landscaping, tunnels, power transmission lines, watercraft, vehicles, et cetera. So if you're not sure if you should be reporting something, read through the instructions in the property section because there's quite a few examples in different sections for special contents and how to report things. The fine art is the next thing we're gonna talk about. So we do have coverage for objects of rare or historic value. So, you know, paintings, uh, artistic works, things like that. Um, we require you to report them by building and location. And then we ask the agencies to keep a local inventory so it's up to the agencies to itemize and inventory their fine art. In PCIS, you will say at you know main hall, we have $5 million worth of fine art. And then you can give a brief description and then the security measures. We don't ask or we don't require you to list every specific item that you have in that building. We just ask for the value of all of your items together. And then if there is a loss, our carriers and our adjusters will put the agency on that itemized list to see what it was valued at. And then fine art is insured to market value. So in the event of a loss, since market value of fine art can fluctuate quite a bit, the adjuster will work with um, the appropriate folks to figure out what the actual market value is for that piece of art at the time of the loss. So. We just ask that you have a reasonable value in your inventory and then we will, our office will work with you at the time of the loss to determine the market value. One thing to remember, personal property of state employees is not insurable. So any personal property, and this comes up mostly in fine art. So if you have somebody that's brought a painting in from home that they um, have in their office for decoration, unfortunately we cannot cover that on our fine arts policy or our property policy. And so you might want to remind your folks, if you know of anybody who has personal property in their office, they need to make sure if it's of value, they need to have um, an endorsement on their personal homeowner's insurance for that fine art or whatever it might be that's not, that's in a state office. Okay, boiler machinery. So boilers and machinery, that's going to be, you know, the boilers that heat our buildings, machinery, things like generators, um, HVAC units, those types of things, fire, fire vessels, boilers, fire tubes, refrigeration units, all of those things. So boiler machinery is part of your property policy. And the boiler machinery part of that policy is for losses that arise because of the operation of boilers and machinery. So if the building burns down, that's gonna be a property policy um, loss or a property loss. And the boiler and machinery, whatever's in the building is covered within that property loss. But if um, 
something malfunctioned with the boiler, or let's say your refrigeration unit quits working, then that would be covered under the boiler machinery policy because that unit or that boiler, that machinery was in motion. It was working when that happened. So that's the difference in the coverage. Depending on the loss, it could go one way or the other, but you need to have your boilers and machinery listed so they are covered for both instances. So when you list your boiler or machinery, you report the Montana boiler number, or if it's not a boiler, let's say it's a refrigeration unit, um, you can either report the ser serial number or if there's like an asset number or something that identifies it to you, that's fine. Um, then you'll choose a name, specific room or building. And when you're reporting things like boilers or fine art, anything besides commercial property and vehicles, when you get to the bottom of that screen that we're looking at, it says assign property. So you need to assign the property where that boiler or machinery is located or where the fine art is located. So that's kind of the final step of adding those types of items to PCIS and assigning the property. So we can tell what state building it's in. Uh, let's see, if refrigeration units with more than $100,000 in perishable inventories. So that's going to be things like, um, you know, your food service type places, uh, specimens or experiments, chemicals, evidence, things like that. If there's over $100,000 of perishable inventories, we also need you to add that as special contents on your property schedule. So that would be coverage for the spoilage. So if the refrigeration unit is down and your perishable inventory perishes, then there, we would have coverage for that if the replacement cost is over $100,000. If it's not, you don't need to report it as special contents. There's still coverage in place. But if it's over $100,000, we need to know about that inventory. Um, and so that's kind of a, an extra step to reporting that, um, but this, the specifics are all right there, so you can come back to that if you need to do so. But the takeaway is if you have 100,000 or more perishable inventories in a refrigeration unit or anything on your boiler machinery schedule, please report that item on your property schedule as well with special contents. All right, burglary and theft. So burglary and theft protects you from the burglary and theft or electronic fraud, employee fraud. If you have cash or checks at a certain location, you need to transport to the bank. Um, any type of financial instrument over $5,000 or precious semi-stone or semi-precious stones or other articles of financial worth need to be reported on your burglary and theft schedule. So 500 or $5,000 on average every day, or if there's more than 100,000 in peak periods. So when you get on your burglary and theft schedule, you'll know, so you'll add the location, the amount, all the questions, the building, and then if you need peak periods, so that would be a good example of a peak period would be the university systems when they, um, the beginning of the semester, when they have re uh, students registering, um, buying books, things like that. They might have more, say they always have $20,000 cash on hand in the bookstore, but at the beginning of the semester, they might have more than that, 100,000, who knows. So that would be a peak period for them. They would just put in that you know, two week period where they have registration as a peak period. And then inside versus outside, is that coverage always required for the cash inside or are you transporting it? So inside versus outside coverage, just fill in the amounts for each of those situations. And then finally, if you do have a peak period in there, it should only be peak periods for the current fiscal year. So if you have ones from prior fiscal years, then you can remove those and coverage on those, add the new dates for the, the new year coming up. And then you'll need to describe your security measures. There's some, there's some options in there for window locks, security systems, and things like that. Okay, business interruption insurance. So business interruption insurance is part of the property program. It protects the state from a loss of income due to a covered peril on the property policy. So an example of that would be if there's a fire at a bookstore on a campus, then that would be a business interruption claim because bookstore burned down as did its inventory. So the bookstore operation would not be able to collect um, to uh, have you know collect its normal revenue at that time. So business income interrupt or business interruption insurance is to move that operation, that revenue producing op operation to a different location, get it up and going again, so you can start collecting your revenue again. 
tax revenue should not be reported. Uh, it would be something that um, taxes we can pay online. Uh, we can pay you know, in person through the mail. So if the building where tax collections were taking place had a covered peril, then that tax collection would just move to a different location. It wouldn't stop completely. So um, tax revenue, fees, things like that uh, wouldn't be required or wouldn't be covered or need to be covered. It's more revenue that is actually associated with that location in that building. So football stadium, if there's an earthquake and the football stadium collapses, you can't have football games. Therefore, that would be something that we would provide coverage for under the business interruption. So when you get in business interruption, this schedule is a little bit different than the other ones. It's not just asking for one item or asset, it's asking for the number of operations. So you would enter your business interruption by operation at a building. So for instance, rent, if you have rent at a building and then you also have a revenue producing operation. So say the university system has rental income and a bookstore in one building. There could be more than one revenue producing operation in a building. So you would list that in PCIS by the revenue producing operation at that building or location. So you would list the revenues and then the name, a description, where it's at. And then there's different categories for revenue. So you would just figure out how much revenue for each of those categories. Then you would hit save on that screen and PCS will keep track of all of that data. Then you will move to the expenditures. So you're putting your listing expenditures that cease after a loss. So contractual adjustments. So bad debt maintenance contracts. If uh, there's a fire and you have no, um, the building burns down, you won't have a maintenance contract at that time. So that would cease, you would list that. Merchandise sold. Um, so it would be your cost of goods before resale. Services purchased from outside that do not continue after a loss, such as, again, janitorial staff, things like that. Consumable supplies, so paper, office products, things that you're not going to need when that location is not up and running. And then finally, ordinary payroll, which is optional. So you would include all employees except your officers, executives, et cetera, employees under contract whose employment would be required during the period of interruption. So payroll, ordinary payroll is optional. You can add that or not. And if you have questions when you're getting to this point, um, you know, feel free to send me an email and we'll run those by um, our carrier if, if we need be. So then you would hit save on your expenditure section of that form. And then the system automatically calculates your revenue less your expenditures and gets you to your bottom line of what's gonna be insured at that for that operation at that location. So business in income interruption is a little bit different than all the other lines of coverage and it takes a little getting used to, but if you have it, um, there's agencies that do use it a lot. And once you get a system of how to report it, it's not too bad to keep just reporting and updating those numbers every year. Okay, tort liability and crime. That's going to be, uh, tort liability is, so any negligence on part, on part of the state employees or agencies. Um, and then fidelity bond, fidelity bond coverage is also called crime coverage. So that applies to cash, checks, convertible instruments for employee dishonesty, forgery, computer theft, or computer fraud, theft, disappearance, destruction. So those two lines of coverage we report together since they're both based on FTEs. Um, the only thing that's required of you is to report the number of class A employees and volunteers every year. I get the total FTEs from um, the governor's office of budget program and planning and then the commissioner of higher ed's office every year. So I get a snapshot at the same time every year um, from those two places, which I use kind of as a, a constant through, or over the years. And then I require the agencies to tell me the number of class A employees they have. So there's a long definition for your class A employees. But it all just boils down to those folks whose primary duty is financial. So just because you have five employees who all have pro cards, um, if they are not your financial staff, they are not class A employees. So class A employees are people who um, you know, do budget stuff, pay the bills, have the authority to approve the bills, things like that. Um, 
So that's all kind of in that long definition. And then auto vehicle insurance. There are two parts of your auto vehicle insurance. Liability, which is mandatory by state. All vehicles have to have liability insurance by um, statute. And then comp and collision. So we'll talk about liability first. Uh, this is reported by the type of vehicles. So any vehicle owned, leased, loaned, rented by the state that is in our care, custody, and control uh, needs to be reported for liability. We cannot provide auto insurance for personal vehicles to state employees. Even if you're a personal business, our auto insurance does not apply to personal vehicles at any time. And we cannot provide coverage for vehicles over 15 passengers without written permission from state risk manager first. So anything over 15 passengers, you need to run by our office and we'll figure out how to handle those. Uh, along, along with the number of vehicles by class. So what you're looking at is 10 passenger cars, five light trucks, 10 medium trucks, uh, things like that. So there's a definition in PCIS of what is a light truck, a medium truck, a heavy truck. There's trailers, passenger cars, self-propelled, um, so all kinds of different definitions you'll need to report the number of vehicles by class for us. And then the total mileage for all of your vehicle activity within your agency. So that can be just, just an estimate. We just need a ballpark estimate of what you, um, what, how many miles your agency is putting on every year. Um, for both of those, you do not need to report vehicles that are leased from the motor pool, from the Depart Department of Transportation, Motor Pool in Helena. Um, those are the only vehicles that you would not include in your vehicle liability account. Count. Any annual lease from motor pool does not get included because transportation includes those in their account and then they include that in part of their um, lease fee that the agency pays. So all of your vehicles need to be included except for your annual motor pool leases in your vehicle liability class count. Um, then we ask you to maintain a list of your vehicles, but you don't need to send that to me. If there's ever any question for a claim, we will contact you and work that out. So we just need the number and type of units by class for your vehicles. Okay, comp and collision. Comp and collision coverage is optional. So that's gonna be physical damage for your vehicle. Um, similar to probably what you have in your personal vehicle. So if you're driving down the road and hit a deer, that would be a comp and collision claim. So some agencies choose to put comp and collision on all of their vehicles. Some agencies choose to put comp and collision on their uh, more expensive, newer vehicles. Some agencies only have a couple of vehicles and, and they just choose to repair them if they do have damage. It's completely up to every agency on how they do that because that coverage is optional. Um, one thing to note, since some agencies are getting drones, it's kind of becoming a more common thing. Drones are considered a vehicle. So you would treat them um, just like a car. So if you want common collision on your drone, then enter it into PCIS on your common collision schedule. If you have a drone, then you need to add it to your self-propelled um, vehicle count when you're doing your liability. So for comp and collision coverage, you would go to your comp and collision screen and add all the information for that vehicle. Year, make, model, VIN number, ownership, address, market value. Again, please enter your market value. Use the link if you need to. Um, and then ownership um, is pretty self-explanatory. Either the agency owns it or you know, it's, a, it's a lease or something like that. There is a category for motor pool lease. So if you do have a motor pool lease, so from transportation in Helena, then choose motor pool lease for the ownership. Uh, again, your vehicle must have an accurate market value so we can provide coverage. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you do have a lot of vehicles parked next to a state building, um, so say for instance, you have a location um, that has 10 folks who have state assigned vehicles to them that park them there every night. If you have more than $50,000 cumulative value of vehicles parked in one location, um, you know, uh, consistently, then you would want to enter that location onto your property schedule, which if it's a state building, it's probably already on there. So we, you would want to add a special content record to that location for vehicles. So only if there's enough or more value than $50,000 altogether 
So that's probably more than two or three vehicles. If you just have one vehicle, you don't need to worry about it. Coverage is provided. If you have more than $50,000 worth of vehicles at that location um, um, permanently, it, it's a normal thing, then you'd wanna add that as special contents to that location. So that's gonna provide coverage for those vehicles in the event of a hailstorm, windstorm, um, you know, if the building catches on fire and it damages those vehicles. Anything that happens when those vehicles are sitting parked next to the building uh, will be covered under the property policy. Therefore, you wouldn't have a bunch of comp inclusion. So if there's 10 vehicles there and there's a hailstorm, there's gonna be one property claim with a thousand dollar deductible that would provide coverage for the roof of that building plus any hail damage to those 10 building vehicles. If you do not report that and they had comp inclusion, and they all had hail damage, then that would be 10 separate comp inclusion claims with a $250 deductible each to fix those vehicles. So just remember, if you have a lot of vehicles in one place, report them as special contents on your property schedule. Um, vehicles, however, that aren't insured for comp inclusion or physical damage do not have coverage while they're moving. So if that vehicle is now not parked next to the state building, but driving down the road and you hit a deer and you don't have comp and collision coverage on it, there would be no coverage. So you, if you would like physical damage, comp and collision coverage, it needs to be on your comp and collision schedule for each and every vehicle. That would provide coverage for anything that happens to the vehicle while it's in motion. And then finally, every year, you need to update your market value for your comp and collision vehicles since vehicle value changes every year most likely it goes down so that'll save you a little bit of premium in the long run okay aviation insurance i'm just going to go over briefly because there's just a handful of agencies that have aircraft and airports if you have aircraft um, we essentially treat them like a vehicle you go and do pcis and you have to answer a bunch of questions the faa number year make model number of seats ownership what they're used for all of that good stuff um, airports, same thing. Uh, Department of Transportation has airports, so they handle those. But again, they just report the specifics that our insurance carrier needs in order to insure those. Okay, and finally, miscellaneous coverage. So that's going to be coverages like foreign insurance. If you have any um, anybody in your agency or university that travels abroad, every spring we send I send out a little announcement with specific election or applications that we have to fill out if you will have any foreign travel. Uh, accidental death and dismemberment professional liability insurance is for the university systems. Same thing, there's a specific uh, separate application that I send out to the university system users and they get to complete that for those coverages. Other lines of insurance that we provide, cyber data security, that's part of your uh, property and crime policies. So there's nothing to report, but it is in place. Uh, the University of Montana has a specialized HIPAA policy. We do have notary bonding on our website. If anybody in your agency needs to be a notary, then you can go to our website and there's some instructions on there to help you uh, work with our broker to get that. And special event liability insurance. If you have an outside party who is using a state a facility to hold an event, such as um, maybe the Boy Scouts use your, your space for their meetings. Uh, and when you require them to have insurance, if they do not have it, they can uh, buy a small policy through that special event uh, liability insurance program. And then finally, surety bonding. That is for the public health and human service institutions. And so we work with them specifically to get that every year. Okay. So with that, I have a couple important reminders. And again, these will all be on the email that you will be getting here shortly with the instructions for the year. But I just wanted to go over them really quick with you. One thing that's really important when you're in PCIS, please use your navigation buttons at the bottom of the screen rather than your back button in your browser. And the navigation buttons just get you to where you really want to be. And the back button can kind of uh, confuse the system sometimes in the browser window. Uh, again, don't forget to assign the property to new records. So when you're putting in new fine art or boilers, make sure you use the assign property button and choose the property where it's located. As it has happened, we're all human. If you enter a new record in error or something goes wrong, please don't start and end coverage on the same day. 
get a hold of Denitza or myself and we can go in and fix that for you. So um, something happens and you do something wrong, just let us know and we can fix it, help you fix it. Um, again, motor pool leases, annual motor pool leases from the Motor Pool Department of Transportation. Choose uh, the MDT motor pool vehicle for the ownership and don't include them in your vehicle liability count. And let's see, oh yeah, burglar and theft. Uh, make sure that you have any, if you have any peak periods from prior years, go ahead and end coverage on those and start coverage on the new ones for 2021. And you only need to report things with, that are over $5,000. So if you have some petty cash in your office, like say $50, that doesn't need to be reported. Just things that valued over 5,000. Uh, revenue streams, again, for business interruption, Buildings may have multiple revenues, so just keep that in mind. And finally, there's the link to that help file again. So it's all over in here. So if you ever have any questions, check out that help file or give us a call. Okay, and with that, um, oh, I talked longer than I thought I would. Oh, oh sorry, before I open it for questions, uh, drones too. Don't forget if your agency has drones, we treat them like a vehicle. So add them to your vehicle liability account and add them to your comp and collision list if you uh, want comp and collision on those drones. And we also have the ability to ensure high value vehicles, such as some of the university systems have some large transit buses that they use for campus transportation. Um, so if you have any high value vehicles, so anything over, let's say $100,000, $200,000, we can put that on a special policy with special coverage. So just contact um, our office for those. All right, with that, uh, if anybody wants to unmute themselves, ask me some questions, uh, or I'll get this out to everybody when we have a copy posted online as well. Hey, Christy. It's Brenda. Hi. Hi, would you please repeat Ms. Bo's first name for us slowly? Denitza. Really? Denitza, she, so she says, okay, Denitza's gonna shoot me if I say this wrong, but it rhymes with pizza. Yeah, okay. Denitza, okay. it rhymes with pizza. <laughs> I had it wrong for months, and now That's I've had so it wrong like, again for more than that. <laughs> It's okay, Thank she's used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Denisa, that's cute. I like it. <laughs> what I Thank thought you. for the second time. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have any questions? Comments? I have something if no one else does. Okay. Let's wait and see if anyone else has questions, though. I don't want to waste right. time. I do. Yeah, that's okay. I have a quick question. Um, the NADA values, um, it doesn't necessarily have like heavy semis and things like that. Do you have a good That's site true. to um, value those? Yeah, Google. <laughs> okay. No, yeah, just um, pretty much what I what we do is we'll just go out and put in the year make model and hit a bunch of sites and say, you know, I mean, I know it's hard all over the country and this and that, but just try to get a reasonable value um, from used, you know, heavy equipment type sites and that do your best. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right, anybody else any questions? Otherwise, Brenda gets to. Um, this isn't gonna be everybody's problem because not everybody has a T-Rex dinosaur skeleton, but we just recently learned that Christie's Auction House sold a T-Rex for $31.8 million. Now I have, you know, you know my, my uh, difficulties with our museum and getting values of their collection. So right. I, I put 20 million on display and 20 million on stored for a total of 40 million. So right. I'll be, I don't have enough for the museum, right? And how does you know, our premium if I slap 31.8 extra on there? Well, your premium is going to be based on your value. So yeah, the more premium, the more value you put on there, the more premium you're going to pay. Um, our carrier is going to want a reasonable value. So the best you can do is ask the Museum of the Rockies to value those artifacts and fossils. Um, and that's, 
as good as you can get. I mean, without, and there's, you're not going to find anybody that's going to do an appraisal because and honestly, um, so side note, a lot of those, some of those fossils in the Museum of the Rockies came from my family's land. Um, so I know a tad bit more about dinosaurs than your average Joe. Um, and so some of it's going to depend on their research values. Some of it's going to depend on, and there hasn't been a lot of fossils sold yet. So there isn't a huge market. And I don't know that there's any way that you can accurately value those. And so if there was a loss, then our carriers would have to come up with some way to accurately value and work with that. I would probably compare it to uh, how they how they took care of Bannock when yeah. Bannock flooded and we had to repair and rebuild that for Fish, Wildlife and Parks a few years back because those are all historic buildings too. It's not like you can just go out and find another 200 year old mining shack and haul it over and slap it up. Mm -hmm. So it would probably be similar to valuing something like that. And so at this point, all you can do is ask, you know, the Museum of the Rockies folks to give you as accurate value as they possibly can for the stuff that they have, you know, exhibited and stored. And that's that's the best you can do. OK, so so assuming that the museum does want to up the value of their collection based on this recent sale of a T-Rex, uh, well, how does that affect our premium then if we do add 32 more million to their Inventory. Well, it's going to be, it's going to be 32 million. So it's going to be More. that part of the pie. So an extra 32 million in, uh, I want to say we have 370 million insured altogether. So whatever yeah. 32 million divided by 370 million will be that much more of their premium. Okay. And the fine art premium is about a hundred thousand. Okay. That's a good way to look at it. But then I would yeah. have to add the the values over at the College of Art. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Christy. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Our information's right there. So if you have any problems at all, questions, send me an email, give me a call. Denise is available as well. Um, this is her second year of reporting. So she's she knows a lot more this year than she did last year. <laughs> <laughs> As a price, she hasn't unmuted herself to yell at me yet. <laughs> no, she oh, here she goes. <laughs> Don't trust me. No. <laughs> All right. Denise. Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. And I'll be sending some messages out here shortly with all of the instructions for the year. And once I figure out, this is my first Zoom training I've ever done. So hopefully I didn't kill you. And when I figure out, Thank you. When I figure out how to post it, I'll let you know where it is. So, okay. all right, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a good Bye. one. You too. Thanks, Christy. Yep. Thanks, Jim.